Hello, everyone. I'm Peter Tabins. I'm member of provincial parliament for Toronto Danforth. Uh, we've just started letting people in, and we're going to let this go for a few minutes. We have uh, well over 150 people that we're expecting, and it could be more than that. So, give us a few minutes as they come in, and when everyone's in, I'll reintroduce myself. Uh, I'll get things started. I'll introduce the panelists, and I'll let you know what we're going to be doing on our agenda this evening. Although. My guess is most of you already know. So welcome. Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Peter Tabbins. Uh, for those of you who have just arrived, I'm the MPP for Toronto Danforth. I want to thank you for coming to this evening's webinar or Zoom meeting, child care, not child care in the pandemic, uh, education in the pandemic. I'm going to start off by giving the land acknowledgement. Uh, and then we'll have a poll. I'll introduce our panelists. We acknowledge we're hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis, and the Inuit peoples. So thank you very much for coming this evening. And we're going to start off with two polls so that we have a sense of who's attending. And the first poll will be a very simple one about where you're from. Are you from Toronto Danforth writing? Toronto, but outside Toronto Danforth, outside of Toronto, or unsure? Uh, we panelists can't vote. All of you can. If you would please click on the one that identifies, this will be a fairly quick process. Hmm. I thought it would be a quick process, but I'm not seeing any votes happening. Okay, I'm going to set that aside for the moment. Uh, I'm sure we can come back to this later. And I'll just proceed with the purpose of the meeting. Uh, we we pulled this meeting together because we've been getting an awful lot of communication from parents, from educators, from people in the community about their concerns about what's going on in the education system. Aha, I have now been informed that attending this evening, 73% are from Toronto Danforth, 14% uh, are in Toronto, but outside Toronto Danforth, and 13% are outside Toronto. That's great. And perhaps, given that it's functioning, we could have the second poll so we can, get a, can have a sense of your interest in the education system. If we have, have that one up, parents, educators, education workers. No, I need the other one, please. Hmm. Well, someday the polling gods aren't with you, right? And then you go on to other things. So a lot of the questions that I've been getting in my office are, Ah, I see. So polling has reasserted itself. If people wouldn't mind noting what your main interest in attending is as a parent of students in the TDSB or other school board, an educator or education worker, a community member still interested in education and student. If you could just take a minute and click on the one that's applicable and then we should get a result back fairly soon. Okay, and so the results, parents, 36%, educators, education worker, 40%, community member, 24%, and no one registered as a student. Okay, gives us a pretty good picture of what's going on there. So what we wanted to do was talk about how children and families are coping, what's the latest news from the province on budgeting, what is the province's plan for extended and remote learning, how do we help students catch up on lost education time? And I've had, I have to say on that question, I've had a variety of comments. Some teachers who I think have done extraordinary work feeling their students have kept up uh, and not slighting any others, but others finding that it's just been very difficult to keep students motivated 
and get the information to them that needs to be done. We're also gonna be talking about when schools will be reopening and what we need to do to keep them safe. For those who are participating, you'll see a Q and A function at the bottom of your screen. If you have questions or comments, please use that function. And one of my staff, Elaine Perkins, will be collecting questions and passing them on to me and I will pose them to our three panelists. Our agenda is very simple. I'm gonna introduce the panelists. They'll speak for about five minutes each. We'll have questions and commentary by the participants. That's all of you. And then we'll have closing comments and information finishing somewhere around 8.30, 8.45 p.m. So let me introduce our panelists. Uh, first, I'll start with Mara Stiles, MPP. She's the Ontario NDP education critic. She represents Davenport Riding, and was formerly a TDSB school trustee. Our next panelist was gonna be Jennifer Story, our TDSB trustee in this riding, but Jennifer contacted us just recently to say that, recently, like half an hour ago, uh, to say that she was still stuck in a budget meeting at TDSB, a meeting that she expected to have finished by seven o'clock. And she will try and make it if she can, but a lot of the substantial questions we'll be discussing tonight, uh, they're already getting at, at that TDSB budget meeting. I wanna introduce Joy LaChica, been an Ontario teacher since 1989. She's currently a member of the Elementary Teachers Federation of Ontario Provincial Executive, past president of Elementary Teachers of Toronto. Uh, she represents members in wards nine and 10. And Joy is really excited to recently become federal NDP candidate in the writing of Peterborough Wartha. So Joy, teaching is just so, so tough compared to being a candidate. I'll just tell you that now. Um, and then we have Claire Haxel. Claire is the proud mom to her nearly four-year-old son and stepmom to a brilliant eight-year-old stepdaughter. Claire's daughter usually attends in-person school, but currently is in a virtual classroom at Dundas Public School. When not parenting, Claire is the executive director of the Choice in Health Clinic and Abortion Clinic in Toronto's West End. And with that, we have the panel and hopefully Jennifer Story will be able to join us. Jennifer. Hi, I'm popping. I hate to say this. I'm popping in. We're on a break. So I, I thought I would jump on for about 15 minutes, but I'm going to have to jump back because we're just getting to the, uh, the funding and budget discussions right now. Well, Thank then you. this is wonderful that you were able to jump in. You're our Toronto District School Board trustee. I don't know if I need to introduce you a lot more, uh, but I will say uh, that you've been trustee for the past six years, representing families in the 33 TDSB schools in our community, sits on the budget committee, which is conflicting with this meeting tonight, co-chair of the board's early years committee as well. She has two teenage sons who attend TDSB schools. And Jen, why don't we start off with you because you are the most elusive our, of our panelists. Uh, I, so I apologize. This may uh, this may seem a bit disjointed, but we're in the thick of things right now. So maybe I'll just touch on a few important points. Yes, please. Um, uh, with respect to the sort of state of play, and I know there's a million questions and a lot that we could talk about. And if I can get back for the Q and A, I certainly will do that. Um, uh, it's been an incredibly difficult year. That's the understatement uh, of the century, um, and that difficulty is not just about the pandemic. That difficulty is about some of the, I think, incredibly ill-informed or uninformed decisions that this government has made with respect to execution uh, of the school year. Um, I know that uh, other provinces right now have their kids at least partially in school uh, with a lot uh, greater safety provisions and, and cautions. And we are not in that situation. A lot of parents are, I've never seen the level of anxiety and stress from parents um, that I'm seeing right now uh, at this stage, this long into things. Uh, and we have no indication that students will be going back to school this year. Um, uh, so I think that, you know, that tells us everything we need to know that that's, a, that's extremely unlikely based on the fact that there isn't even a, a conversation about what that might look like with school boards. But we also know that this government has a great habit of making a Friday announcement and changing their mind for the following Monday. So who knows? Um, and that is, you know, that is one of the reasons why this has been such a difficult year, because that's very difficult for educators. It's very difficult for parents. It's very difficult for kids to be constantly 
pivoting as, as has become one of our favorite words during the pandemic. Um, so that's about this school year. Um, we do know that I, I'm proud to say that the Toronto District School Board did make a decision very recently to oppose the government's uh, seeming intent to make a, an online option a permanent option, which in, in effect, I think I, I just want to take a second and explain what that means. That means that we would have an entirely separate system, separate cache of teachers, and, and delivery of education, if you will, that would exist all the time that people could theoretically move through from K to grade 12 online, right? That's the worst case sort of scenario with that. And I think, um, you know, there's a lot of reason to uh, be very cynical about that decision coming or that, that um, approach being floated right now, when of course for next year, we will want to make some online opportunities available for families who have pre-existing health conditions or a variety of, of, of very real and understandable concerns with respect to going back into the bricks and mortar school system full time right away. Um, and, and it's a great way to slip this in and make this thing permanent because people's minds are open now to the possibility. Some people have seen this work very well. Some of our educators have moved heaven and earth to make online work as best as we can. Nonetheless, I think we don't have any evidence right now to really back up the, the possibility that that is as, as quality, as high quality a system, as good for our students as bricks and mortar school. And I see Joy nodding. I don't think there's any way we can replace that face-to-face -face contact with students and learners um, that, that would happen, you know, that, that is removed from the equation for online school. So, we, uh, I, I know that some people as well, I'm just sort of jumping from issue to, to try and jam as many things in here as possible. We have announced that it's gonna be a quadmester high school model for next year. I know that makes a lot of people unhappy. Um, that is because if we do need to pivot, the quadmester model makes that easier. Um, and there are also a lot of kids who thrive in the quadmester. So I wouldn't say it's, it's a simple decision to say it's one, one's bad, the other's good. You know, some kids thrive in a full year model, some in a semester model, some in a quadmester model. Um, but it provides us the flexibility to, to and also allows us to, to keep cohorts limited, which is one of the things that as we don't know how many kids, will, high school kids will be vaccinated by the fall, it allows us to still maintain um, a, um, a reduced number of contacts, right? Um, but overall, at this point, we're looking at um, kids being back to school um, full time <laughs> and, and, and staffing our schools up full time. I also know there's a lot of concern about what's being called the hybrid model. In other words, where that, um, where that option for remote happens, that it's attached to the local school and that teachers may be expected to teach both in person and virtual simultaneously. I can say for myself that I will certainly be keeping an eye out for that and would oppose that. Um, and, um, and it's early days with the planning. So I don't, I don't know where that's going to come up, but I know that um, I know for certain last year, we, that was a last resort option. And, and what we're looking at more likely in Toronto has an advantage in this regard is probably a hub model. So a cluster of schools in a geographic area kids from that cluster being taught virtually with teachers sort of still attached in an administrative way to the local school. And hopefully we have the numbers that, that, that people won't have to teach simultaneously, but that also comes down to dollars. So I'll leave it at this because we could talk at, uh, at length and I know that your other panelists will have lots to contribute to many of these pieces. Um, they're only funding us for a half year on some of the some of the major funding envelopes, which troubles me and is very difficult with respect to planning. So I think that's something I would hope that that Marit and Peter <laughs> um, uh, and Joy, all of you in your respective constituencies can take up uh, some uh, inquiries about what the logic is there and why that's possibly good for school boards and students and teachers to have an, uh, more instability baked into the system. Um, but I will say I try to keep folks updated through my newsletters. Um, before I jump offline, I will put my, um, my newsletter link in the chat so that if anybody wants to um, get that, uh, sign up for that, you'll get budget updates and, and updates about decisions as we go forward. 
And if people have questions that I won't be able to answer directly here, I'm always available on my email. Um, though it's high, pretty high traffic right now, I do keep up and will answer within, within four to five days at the latest, if not sooner. Um, and that's the jennifer.story at tdsb.on.ca. Thanks so much for the opportunity, Peter. And uh, I'll stay in line for a few minutes and, uh, and listen in for a, a little bit longer. Thanks for that. And thank you very much. Thank you so much for taking the break and, and joining us. That was invaluable. Uh, before I go to Mart, I just want to say, you know, someone had asked, we are recording this webinar. We will be posting it so people will have access to the information. Uh, a number of people have asked questions in advance of this webinar. Uh, they've been circulated to the panelists and a number of them are also just simply on our list of questions that we'll be raising and uh, we now have more than 200 participants as part of this zoom webinar and with that i'll go to marit styles marit it's all yours thank thanks peter and uh thank you it's so great to be here thank you for inviting me to be part of this amazing panel and it's great to see so many folks here uh particularly all of you parents, education workers, and people that care about education. Uh, I wanna say it's also been a very hard year. Uh, people have been through a lot. I want to thank you, all of you watching for what you've done to protect yourselves and others and for staying healthy. Uh, really, this is the most important thing that we've accomplished this year. So, Wow, if you look back over the last year, it is hard to believe that it was just over a year ago that we were fighting a government that was dead set on cutting 10,000 education workers from our schools, uh, forcing students into four mandatory online courses and so much more. Um, and since then, you know, looking back over the last year, it's been difficult. I know I personally, as a parent of a teenager who's who's so still in high school now uh, and, uh, and one in university, uh, I certainly never imagined we'd be in the place we're at right now uh, a year later. Um, and I think it's really important to look at, so taking all of that into consideration, I wanna, what I wanna do right now is, is share a little bit about what's happening now uh, and what, you know, look, hopefully we'll learn something of, from the last year, uh, but let's like, look as well at what's coming at us. Um, so just more recently, right, it was, April 11th, that the Minister of Education sent a letter to all of us parents informing us that schools were going to remain open. Don't worry. And then on April 12th, he stood with the with the premier to say that actually, oh, guess what? They're going to close. And they remained closed ever since. And yes, schools closed because of a preventable, I would argue, third wave, um, a surge in community cases, but they also closed because the government refused to put the resources needed in to make them safer. And I, I absolutely believe that. I think the proof is there. You know, at the time of the closures, almost 30% of schools province-wide had at least one case of COVID-19. Uh, we were still hearing stories of classes as big as 27, 29 or more students, desks crowded together, a family's not able to take work off if they had a child with symptoms because the government was refusing and continues to refuse to really provide paid sick days, uh, classes sent into isolation causing havoc, classes being canceled because of a lack of staff as they were falling ill as well, and, and then the promised layers of protection were nowhere to be seen. And the government kept saying, we're gonna add more layers of prote protection. We're gonna promise 50,000 asymptomatic tests a week. Well, it, we never came close to hitting that goal. They were completely, I will say unprepared, but also unresponsive. And in fact, in all of the announcements that were made uh, and all of the funding that came from the federal and the provincial side that was put forward for things like extra staffing, it was only enough to average about one and a half new workers of all sorts per school. So it is no surprise that we ended up with disruption and longer closures. And now, of course, uh, Jennifer mentioned a lot of what's happening and what this is going to mean for families. I know a lot of people are looking for answers now about you know when is school going to return. Uh, I think what Jennifer said is very telling. Uh, nothing that we've seen from the government so far in the budget a few weeks ago or in the release that came out last week about how education is going to be funded in the next school year there was nothing in there about now 
about what they're doing now to get our children back to school and if that's possible. And I want to say, like, of course, we know that we have to prioritize being well and and keeping our hospitals um, not overwhelmed. And this is a terrible time. But um, the government, the fact that they are just basically seem to be wiping their hands of this school year, I find very short sighted and very concerning. And I mean, if you look back, uh, and I'll just mention it because because Jennifer did, but the government came out with what they call the grants for student needs, which is the main way that they the funding package for school boards every year. And they came out with it just last week. And the Minister of Education talked, you know, um, about what he thought was going to be needed in September, and he seemed to skip over this term, as I said, completely. Um, and to many of us, you know, it sounded like he'd given up. Um, and in fact, when you look at that budget for next year, as, as Jennifer mentioned, you know, Stephen Lecce, the Minister of Education says, historic levels of funding for education. But as I said to him in the legislature just last week, no, it's, it's hysteric, historic levels of, of lies and inaccuracies. In fact, it's a cut to education. It's, it's an increase, if there is an increase, and this is debatable, we're still looking at the numbers, but deep in there, if anything, it's an increase of about 0.2%, which is not gonna keep up with inflation and means no supports, no additional supports for our children or for the education workers who've been working so hard. Um, I, I want to mention very quickly before I move on, and you have lots. We'll have lots of time to talk about this. But as as Jennifer mentioned, the whole uh, permanent online learning piece, which is the other piece of what's kind of come out, emerged in the last few weeks. The government tried to keep it quiet. They they released a document and told everybody that they weren't allowed to talk about it. But but of course people in the education sector were so concerned that it got leaked. Um, and this document shows very clearly, and the minister is quite open about it now, that this government is planning to make online learning permanent from K to 12. And as Jennifer mentioned, I mean, this is the government, this is a minister of education who, who really wants to privatize education. And I want to be very clear, you know, when we hear about moving online learning out of the hands, hands of school boards and centralizing it with TV Ontario or TFO, you think, well, they're public, right? So what's the big deal? But the big deal is that uh, the government has also given themselves new powers and new powers to TVO for the minister to determine which third parties are contracted to develop that learning. And so what we see here is funding that's going to go take be taken from our school boards, sent to TVO and to whatever third party which could be a private company uh, to deliver and uh, develop these programs. It's a very, very, very concerning. I'm gonna share with you a little later a petition um, in the chat. Um, I, I, there's so much that we're gonna talk about today. I don't wanna go on anymore, but I do wanna say also to all of the education workers and the parents out there, thank you for all you've done. This has been such a difficult time. You have done so much to, as Jen said, pivot. Uh, you have you have put everything into it. It has been extraordinarily difficult. Uh, it's not over anytime soon. Um, but I want you to know we've got your back. Uh, Peter and I and our fellow MPPs at Queen's Park are fighting all of these developments really hard. We believe that there's a lot more the government should be doing to ensure that our children, our students are supported, properly supported. And that's going to mean funding and that we're going to end up um, with safely reopened schools in the fall. So thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be here. Okay. Mara, thank you very much for that. Um, folks, before we go on our next panelist, we have about 200 people who are in the meeting this evening. Uh, for those of you who've arrived recently, if you have a question, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to pass it on. I'm already starting to get questions that I'll be posing to the panelists when they finish making their presentations. And with that, I'll go to Joy LaChica. Joy, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Peter. It's just such a pleasure to be here with you this evening. And um, I just want to acknowledge my colleagues that are here on the panel. Um, it's just delightful to be with you here. We've been together through a lot of this. 
um, that, that that Merit has, has described over this last year, and Jennifer at the board, and our parents, Claire, uh, a parent in, in, in our constituency, where would we be without each other? And um, it's, it's, it is important to look back and uh, I'm just going to share a little bit as well. As, Ma as Marit did, I I'm going to look back to this past year just for a few minutes um, to contextualize this. And, and forgive me if I repeat anything, but I think there's a lot that we're all wrapping our heads around. So repetition can be good. Just over a year ago, all across the, the city of Toronto, four public education affiliates came together in a way they haven't for 25 years. And, and they came together to march around Queens Park against the ruthless and unsustainable cuts to education that this government has brought in. We marched, it was OSSTF, it was AEFO, it was AWECTA, it was QP, um, it was all of the affiliates, the four affiliates and ETFO of course. And the walls of the legislature trembled. And I know that we were heard. Parents joined us, our fellow affiliates joined us and students joined us. It was incredible. And together we saved our full day, so full supported kindergarten. And as Marit explained earlier, we, we didn't lose our DECEs and the quality kindergarten program that the government had threatened to rip away. So all of these actions and our political action in solidarity makes such a difference. But little did we know that that was only a warm up, and we had no idea how soon education would be threatened again. Three waves of the pandemic and a government peddling a narrative of safety of safe distancing, of PPE, of only community spread, while the data began to surge. So then Ottawa stepped in and our classrooms never did receive all of the two billion of federal money to ensure that the PPE was there, to make sure that the classes were smaller and that we were distanced. There were many classrooms without HEPA filters in schools. And where were those nurses that were promised? The mobile units they said were coming to high rises and hot spots never showed up. Not then and not early enough and not when it would have made a difference. And if all of this isn't enough, now together we're talking about a return to learning like it's never been before. And it's threatened by the government who won't listen, who won't consult with experts, with parents, with teachers. No, never. But a week ago when a news conference, those same marchers from all those affiliates and experts in education and, and people like Dr. Uh, Carol Campbell from OISE and Annie Kidder from people in education, for education, they came together along with the affiliates to say, the teachers, the experts, the education workers, that evidence shows this, that students learn better in person and that permanent virtual learning is nothing but a cut. Another cut to schools and to classrooms to further privatize learning, as Marit so, so clearly stated for us. Teachers have risen to an emergency and we're doing many things, juggling many things. And also many of us who are teachers are parents and, and parents who are teachers and teachers who have their children next to them are having to deal with many different uh, platforms. And, and here's an example of hybrid learning. This is a visual of it that uh, Jennifer spoke of earlier. This is what the government has announced, in, in essence, what should be happening in, in boards throughout Ontario. That not only will we be teaching our large classrooms that are not safe and protected of 30 or more students, we, we might have to teach a cohort online as well of, of 15, 20 students, however many. And, and this is not the best for our students. And this is not what they should be returning to. So as we all rise to an emergency, we hold our children and we seek to carry our students to the other side of this pandemic. 
but to butcher an education act. And that's what they intend to do is that they want to change legislation to make this happen. It's outrageous and it's counterintuitive to have to learn in isolation as a child, almost like in a plastic bubble. On the other side of a glass, behind a screen, through the spring, the summer, the fall, the winter, to have our children kept from each other, from what they need developmentally, the play-based learning with their peers, the social engagement they need, and a physical space where they can move. They need it and to not have it as criminal. They need to learn safely with the caring adults that are there as a team. The DECEs, the early childhood educators, the ed assistants, the special needs assistants, their speech pathologists, their teachers. When this emergency is over, our children deserve the very best. They're safe, they're nurturing place, they're precious public school where no one is left behind. Let's do this again. Let's organize as parents, as students, as community, as politicians, and as allies to stop Ford now and more unseated government so loathing of public education. Thank you. Joy, thank you very much. Appreciate that a lot. And I will now go to our last panelist. Just a reminder for those who may not have heard me earlier, if you have a question or a comment you want to pose, use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen, and we'll soon get to your comments and questions. Claire, Claire Haxel, uh, as our parent representative, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and Joy, oh my gosh, it's really hard to go after you. That's so <laughs> passionate and well said. And what's there, what else is there to say? That's just amazing. Um, but thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to be here and especially as a parent representative. And I think it is so, so crucial to be including parents' voices in these conversations. Um, as, a, as a parent, that's where I feel often like there's no space for me. I don't know where I'm supposed to go to talk about my concerns. And I don't think I need to tell anyone here, all 200 of you, that this has been a hard year. It really doesn't matter how you're connected to education. Um, if you're a parent, a teacher, or a kid, I fully believe everyone is at their breaking point. And as a parent, when I think about what we need for safety, I think what we need is forward thinking and planning. Parents cannot keep having this reactionary ping-ponging around where you don't know where you're going to send your children on Monday morning. You don't know where you're going to be next month. We all have employers if we're lucky. And we don't know what to tell them. Are we working from home? Can we go in? Can you work at night? Can you work during the day? There's just very little planning and very little forward thought put into almost anything. And I'll give you an example of that. I read on, uh, on Twitter about mm, two weeks ago that the province had about 10 days to get every teacher their first vaccination to ensure that they were on schedule to get their second vaccination before September. And I'll tell you, there's no way that every single teacher in the province of Ontario has had their first vaccination. So we know for sure that there are going to be teachers unvaccinated in the schools again. And how is that good for parents? How is that good for kids when they're teachers who are doing everything they can as frontline workers and are in unsafe situations? I work in healthcare. We made sure that our staff are vaccinated, our staff have access to PPE, our staff are spaced out. This is not happening in schools. And we're asking, parents are desperate for their kids to go to school. And we're asking teachers to put themselves at risk to do it. And by extension, then put their children, the kids at risk potentially to bring the virus back into our homes. And this is just unacceptable. So what do we need for a safe opening? I mean, we've, we've, I feel like the other panelists have really talked about it, but I think the very first thing and what I hear from parents and, you know, I was in line at the daycare today to pick up my son. He, he's almost four, a couple weeks. He'll be starting kindergarten in September. And I was asking the other parents, what do you need in September? And what I just keep hearing over and over again is they need school to be open. There is no plan B. 
many of these families, they made it through last year because the kids were smaller, they could extend their maternity leaves or parental leaves. But if you have a really small child, one starting in kindergarten, that cannot do remote learning on their own. Our, my eight-year-old stepdaughter, she's getting pretty good, I have to admit. She can manage, she can navigate the system pretty well. But my four-year-old, I don't know what my four-year-old's gonna do. And I have to go to my clinic, I have to go to work. So I'm not really sure um, <laughs> what we're gonna do in September if the school doesn't open. And I feel like there's a lot of parents in that situation. So that's the first thing, we need the schools to be open. The second thing I've already touched on is we need the teachers to, and staff to be vaccinated. It just seems like it's such a no brainer. How are we still talking about who is essential and who isn't? And how was it ever that teachers weren't? It seems outrageous. And we need upgrades to ventilation. And honestly, I think probably we could have used those upgrades many, many years ago. Um, I, I grew up going to school in the TDSB and going to high schools here, and there was poor ventilation then. There was asbestos in my school then, and I'm sure there's asbestos in the school now. And I have, I have never seen a HEPA filter inside a school, so I don't even really know what those are or when we're going to see them. Um, we also really need rapid and non-invasive testing done regularly for our kids. And there's a lot of different ways that that can be done. That could be offered at the schools, that could be given out to families or discounted and parents could be doing it at home. They aren't perfect tests and I get that, but we need to be have a better sense of who we're sending into our schools every day. Even if we're getting some false positives and it's not perfect, at least we're not waiting until a kid is sick and has already been hanging out with all these other kids having lunch before we find out that now, now there's a COVID case and now in fact there's 10 or 15 in the classroom. So we need those class tests and they exist. And ultimately we need the smaller classrooms and hearing that there are classrooms with 27, 30 kids, I just don't understand how anyone can say that. I, I can't go into a store with more than nine people in it, but we're gonna have a classroom for seven hours with 30 kids? It doesn't make sense. I don't understand. And these inconsistencies are, again, that ping-ponging of parents back and forth. They don't, we don't get good information and it's hard to know what to plan for in the future. Another piece that I feel I hear from parents and hasn't really worked well is the seamlessness of, um, or lack of seamlessness of remote learning when your kid invariably has to come home. So my stepdaughter was home three times in the fall before her school closed. And each time it was, she had a sniffle or, or my son's daycare had, a, someone had a sniffle and she had to stay home for a week. And there was just nothing for her to do for that week. And so we have a lot of privilege in our life. We have a lot of great books. We have a lot of great activities that we can do at home to keep her occupied. But ultimately she just missed nearly a month of school because we were trying to do our part and keep her home. And I know that there are so many parents for whom that would be impossible. They couldn't keep their kid home. They, ha they have to send their kid to school because they have to go to work. The things that I think have worked really well is how incredible teachers have been. And I know how hard it is for them. Um, one of my sisters is a teacher. I have in-laws who are teachers and I see how hard they're working. And I see how they've completely redesigned lesson plans and teaching modalities but I also see them completely burnt out and overstretched and unsupported. And you can absolutely, and you can see how that comes out in the number of times a substitute has had to come into the virtual classrooms because the teachers are completely burnt out and need, need a break because they don't have any support. And I guess I'll just wrap up, but before I finish, I also asked my stepdaughter how, what she thought, like what was the best thing about remote schooling and what was the worst thing about remote schooling? And she's told me that, the best thing is the snacks, because I guess our snacks are better at home than they are in school. I'm not surprised. Um, but she said the worst thing is that she's extremely lonely. She misses her friends. She doesn't see them. The screens when she's learning, all of the screens are blacked out. The, you know, see the kids' names and the teacher talking. They don't have the same interaction, interactive play. They don't have play-based learning. They're not doing skits and role playing and having all of the social interaction that so much of school is about. I know curriculum is important. I want her to learn the curriculum. I have 
thought for curriculum in Ontario before and making sure our curriculum is up to date and accurate. But I also know that a massive part of going to school is learning how to function in the universe, learning how to talk to your peers, learning how to overcome conflict, how to have fun when you're bored, how to come up with creative activities, how to deal with a teacher you don't really like. These are important life skills that curriculum is one thing. I know we can catch up, absolutely. But I don't know how you catch up on relationships and all of those this year of lost relationships. So I'll just end there and let's uh, let's get some okay. questions. Claire, thank you very much. You panelists, you're wonderful. This excellent presentations. Um, I'm going to start off with questions then because we've got quite a lot coming in. And um, Mart and Joy, I'm going to try this first one on you. Do we know if educators are being prioritized for vaccination? And what is the vaccination rate? <laughs> well, yeah, Joy, do you want to go first or I can go? I mean, it, it really well, depends yeah. on where you're talking about it in this province, to be honest. Um, you know, we we it's really hard to get a handle on it, too. I just want to add I've tried to go to different boards and I know that um, unions as well. And Joy may be able to speak to this it, are having trouble tracking it um, because there's just no way to do that. Uh, so, I mean, anecdotally, we know that um, this has been a real mess. Uh, that a lot of education workers remain uh, unvaccinated. Um, and as you, as I think, and I can't remember who mentioned this, but um, when you look at the vaccination schedule and you look at what, you know, what they're, when they're talking about having all this done, uh, you can see that it's looking very unlikely that everybody will have both shots before September. And that's deeply concerning. So um, I, they are supposed to be prioritized, but again, it really depends on what what board you're with and what public health unit you're with in terms of how that's being delivered and, and how many people are actually getting the vaccines. I don't know if Joy, you wanna mention anything else? Well, one thing I will share is that uh, when I'm visiting with teachers and I'm, I'm having virtual meetings uh, at lunchtime um, with, with teachers in schools, um, even though they're uh, remote, um, it was, it was in a, a hotspot school in Toronto's Northwest. The steward told me that most of the teachers in her building were unable to access a vaccine when they were told they could. That the, the, the coordination is not in place uh, in and around this. I can't speak to other boards, but I, I know in our board and, and in the city of Toronto, uh, the coordination was just a muck uh, a couple of weeks ago. Now we know that in this this last, you know, under two weeks, just over a week, we know that all teachers apparently are prioritized for access to the vaccines. But you know, it, it, it's very difficult sometimes to get the information, as you said, Marit. Um, there isn't a whole lot of transparency from Toronto Public Health all the time. And it's just really, really hard to get a sense, except to be able to talk to our members and the teachers in buildings and ask them. Um, and, and many times we're hearing that they haven't been able to access it and they've wanted to. So it remains to be seen, I think. Yikes. Um, Joy and Mara, thank you for that. I have a question and comment from Joanne. If school is the safest place for children, according to Minister Lecce, why is there no discussion as to a return to in-class learning? And Claire, to echo you, children of all ages need to be physically engaged with both peers and teachers to receive the most of education experiences. They need this for their social, emotional development. Uh, so I'm gonna go first to, if school is the safest place for children, why is there no discussion of return to class? Mart, because you get to spend more quality time with the minister than the rest of us, uh, what can you bring us? Well, I don't know if I'd call it quality time, but uh, I do get to ask the minister some direct questions. And I often, I want to say, I feel like often it's a great privilege to be able to do that because I know how many of you would like to ask him a few questions or give him a piece of your mind. And uh, I try as best I can, and I know you do too, Peter, we try to channel that uh, in question period and in, in debates. Um, why, why aren't we back in school? Why isn't school the safest place for our kids? Um, you know, it, they should be, it really should be. And what we've seen the government do is now, uh, they've had a year 
a year to get it right. And they ignored, and we've seen this in terms of education, we've seen this in all, I think in all aspects of this pandemic, which is they've refused to listen to the experts. And I, and I mean the public health experts and the, the front line, but I mean also the, the education workers too, who were telling them what needed to happen. I mean, a really good example of this is the smaller class sizes. And I saw somebody in the comments say, you know, smaller class sizes when we had them in some of our schools this year were great. It was amazing. And, you know, it, it was interesting because in Toronto, our boards managed to do that. They managed to, in some cases, bring down class sizes quite a bit. And that was really great. It didn't happen across the province. It didn't happen even in boards nearby us. Uh, they certainly, the government didn't fund it that way. And it's really unfortunate because that's a really good example of if we could have maintained greater distancing, if we could have gotten asymptomatic testing happening earlier, much earlier, we've been calling for it in the NDP official opposition since last summer. Uh, we should have had that happening. If they'd actually invested in better air quality and as, as you know, we heard from, uh, from, from Claire, you know, the, the HEPA filters, the, you know, all of this, I mean, even just getting the windows open, I've been talking to experts in air quality who've been learning over the last year, you know, what we know now that we understand this, this virus a bit better, we know that what has to happen is the air has to change over in the classrooms. So opening a window is really not going to do it. And the government has had a chance to, they've had a year to deal with this and they didn't do it. And why, why? because they didn't want to spend the money. Because, and I'm gonna say it, and I know a lot of you agree with me because you email me about it, because they wanna under, they don't really care about publicly funded education. In fact, they wanna privatize education. That's their, that is absolutely what this Minister of Education wants his legacy to be. He wants to keep kids online because it means they can cut teachers. It can save, they can save money on the backs of our kids. And I'm telling you, it's, uh, it is, it will 100% and we all know it, drive down the quality of our education. So it's, it's, that's my rant, but, uh, but that's why it's this government and we should, that's why we have to keep pushing. We can't let them get away with this. We have to keep pushing for more and better because they made a choice and they made the wrong choice. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to go to the next question. We got a lot of questions, so I'm just going to barrel through as fast as I can. I've got Rita asking, are teachers and school boards and parents being consulted before the government announces these different education delivery channels? Claire, I'm going to start with you as a parent about whether or not you've been consulted, although I have a guess. And then, Joy, I'm going to go to you. Claire? Well, the answer is just no. <laughs> I mean, there's... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's straightforward I mean, I enough. I how I feel about it, but no, I... I I'm not as involved as a, at the parent teacher association level in my school. I, and in fact, I think even in our, in our chat, I can see in the participants here that there are, there are people up from my school who are probably more involved, but I mean, the short answer is just no, parents are not consulted. Parents are just told in three days, your life has to flip over, deal with it. Yeah. Okay, Joy, I'm gonna go to you. Peter, there is no real consultation going on with, with those who are on the ground that know our children best, uh, that, that understand what's needed in education and provide the, the programs that are specialized, that are individualized, that are rich and full. No discussions are happening with teachers, with educators um, on that level. Um, you know, there there's a form of communication at splintered tables um, and, and there, there are announcements made from podiums and that's how, where we get our information most of the time uh, in, in media scrums and, and, uh, and, and through those kind of communication channels and, and the lack of transparency, the lack of consultation is just appalling. And to think that they would even begin to, to try to legislate and change an education act and, and the form of teaching and learning that's so tried, true and proven and in the world um, is, is respected as quality public education, that, that they would do what they're doing 
and, and make these decrees and these announcements without any consultation is, is just really a shame. Thank you. I'm gonna go on to the next question and comment from Jeffrey. And I think Mar, you may have some things to say about this. Were they, I'm assuming the Ford government, ever planning to improve the physical environment of the schools to prevent COVID spread in schools and keep them open even through the societal lockdown? It feels like even if the schools were perfectly safe, they would always have ordered them closed in order to send a message of stay at home, times aren't normal. And Claire, this reflects some of what you had to say. How do we get the message across that in-person education is essential for small kids and we need the schools to be safe and open, even if we have to close other things in society to prevent COVID spread? Uh, Mark, do you wanna speak first about the intention with regard to improving the physical environment of the schools? Yeah, um, you know, I, I, I think in, in September, uh, Doug Ford came out and said, we're gonna give, I think it was 50 million. I've kind of lost track because I, we have no proof that it was spent, um, but made an announcement that they were gonna spend, you know, 25, 50 million on getting, um, improving air quality in schools. And he said, and I will remember, I remember this very clearly, he said, if if it was just me, I'd walk in. If it were like I would, could, you can walk into a warehouse and you can fix that warehouse in a day, and no problem. You'll have greater air quality. And I thought, what do you know about schools? Um, as you know, Claire mentioned, like we have these old schools. Uh, air quality has been an ongoing issue, uh, let alone heat, air conditioning, all kinds of other things, repairs. And under the Liberal government, we before this government, we saw uh, the the backlog in capital repairs rise to $15.8 billion in repairs that need to be done. Under this government, in just a couple of years, it went up to $16.3 billion. Now, when you start talking in those numbers, it's just impossible to comprehend what that looks like. But I think we all know, because we see in the schools that our kids attend. And uh, and the truth is uh, that they did manage, you know, there were some donations of HEPA filters and things like that and attempts to get things out into classrooms. And there was a little bit of that going on, but it took way too long. Um, and to this date, we do not have any proof that they are doing any kind of testing of air quality in schools. So there's a lot that needs to be done that they could be doing right now. And, and I think the evidence and what I'm hearing from boards across the province is this is not happening. So they are, you. not only are they just not getting, you know, preparing to open schools right now or to preparing for a better September, but they really haven't, um, but they aren't doing anything in our schools right now to you know, take advantage at least of this moment to keep that work going. And I think that's really shows you know, how little they care or how little they really expect to reopen schools fully. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna to go to the next comment and question. Virtual school is largely ineffective for young kids. Uh, echoing you, Claire, on that. They cannot sit in front of a screen all day and absorb information. What do you think will happen if, for example, basic literacy is behind grade level for a significant portion of the kids who are currently supposed to be developing basic reading and numeracy skills. Uh, Joy and Mark, can I start with you two on that one? Sure, I, I, I can begin if that's okay. Um, so I, I know that we're worried about how our children are faring in this time and, and we, you know, prior to anything like a pandemic, we, we were concerned about screen time. Um, that too many hours in front of a screen, a screen is not healthy and um, just on a vision level, on a addiction level, all of that. And now we continue to have those concerns. You know, we have some amazing teachers that have been engaging students in, in virtual school. And it's wonderful that they've been able to make some strides this year. Uh, my own daughter, who's in grade five, has been in virtual school for a while, and she has a, a very caring and um, just a, a super teacher, and, and she's been doing pretty well. However, it's not natural to be in front of a screen for all that time, not to have the, the physical space, not to have that peer exchange. And, and when she does return to a regular situation, I know that there will probably be a reading level that isn't quite where it should be. And there are, will be some math skills that uh, need some time. And, you know, the thing is that the teachers are, 
really excellent at being able to pinpoint what the needs are and to scaffold the work to remediate um, and, and the team, the whole education team is so essential. Um, the ed assistants, um, the, the, the special needs assistants and teaching teams, many teachers and, and, and adults working with a student. Now the healthy routines that we have in regular bricks and mortar are so important. We don't have that in, in a virtual setting day in and day out. So, you know, when we can get our kids back to a place where they can have those healthy routines and a schedule, I think that we'll see the rhythm of learning and, and the, just the spiral of growth in their academics really uh, improve again. And, and, and it's a team effort. It, it's, it's parents, it's uh, educators, and um, we're, we're working on this all together. Okay. Mart, did you want to speak to that one? Well, I mean, Joy speaks so well about it. I, I was going to say, I mean, I think there is, you know, looking forward, the, opti the optimist in me says our teachers are professionals. There are these amazing caring adults that work in our schools, uh, teachers and other education workers who will, who are thinking now, of course, about these issues. And they're thinking about how that's going to work when they get back and they're going to they're thinking and they have the professional judgment to be able to see where some children have fallen behind and need more assistance than others, etc. And we know that that's the other thing right is that there are these the where there were already struggles these this situation has just exacerbated that for a lot of students. Um, what I would like to see and what I've been pushing the government to do is to just put a lot I mean this is why we need the government not to be cutting school funding right now, but to be investing a lot more in so that we can support those educators in the classrooms. Maybe we need more educational assistance. Maybe we need, you know, more other kinds of educational professionals in our schools to provide the support that our kids may need, that especially those kids who are struggling. Um, but, you know, 100%, um, this is the time to invest in all of those things. And the government is, has chosen not to right now. Thank you. Um, Claire, I, oh, did you want to speak to this? Because yeah. I have a comment that I'd like you to comment on, but go ahead. Okay. <laughs> I was just going to say that when we talk about, you know, some kids might fall behind, especially around literacy, I think one of the things we really need to name and say out loud is that that's an equity issue, that many of the kids who are going to fall behind are the kids from lower resourced families, and it's widening that gap, that gap. And we already know that the kids who are entering kindergarten with a library at home and they can write their name and they know their letters are coming from wealthier neighborhoods, wealthier families, families where English is the first language in the home. And this is really an equity issue um, as much as it's an education issue that the families who the newcomers to Canada, the families where the parents are holding multiple jobs, where the older sibling is doing the tutoring, those are the kids who by far and away are gonna be falling behind the most. Well, I'm gonna follow on with that because there's a comment here that I'd like you to respond to. It's from Sarah. I'm a high school educator in the Toronto Catholic District School Board, all girls high school. I'm concerned about the hybrid model on many levels. If the hybrid model goes ahead, many of my students will be trying to learn and teach siblings simultaneously. I've heard many people discuss how impossible it is to work and support younger students, but I've not heard a discussion about the difficulty of learning while providing childcare. I think this is an equity conversation worth having. Claire, if you could comment on that, it would be useful. I mean, thank you, Sarah, so much for that comment and for your work as a teacher and, and as a frontline worker. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the other piece to this narrative that we aren't talking enough about is this is a gender equity issue and that by far and away, it has been women who have left the labor force, women who have stayed home, women who've had to learn to become teachers off at night off the corner of their desk. And, you know, you're, Sarah, you're absolutely right. I have not heard this conversation about uh, teenage girls having to teach their younger siblings, but I am not even remotely surprised. Um, it's it's been true for a couple hundred years and unfortunately it's still the way in 2021 when a child needs to be taken care of more often than not it's a woman that has to do it and that has to change i agree i'm going to go to the next question from michelle michelle very nice to have you here this evening 
Uh, if the Ford government is so hell-bent on making online learning permanent by using schools and teachers to be responsible for this, who is responsible for school supplies and resources? My kids have been online since wave one. Their peers who are in a brick and mortar school receive supplies and we receive nothing. How is that equitable? Uh, I wouldn't mind having a round of the three of you. I'm gonna start with Marit, go through Joy and come back to you, Claire. Marit? You know, the, that's a really interesting point you're raising, Michelle. And um, uh, it's and it's one I've heard from other parents as well. And I, I think a couple things come to mind. One is um, that, uh, that the government is not thinking about these issues at all, that they haven't considered those issues. I know that I wanna say like in some of the cases when we first moved online, like this time last year, um, school boards and stuff tried really hard to make sure that some of the technology and everything followed the kids and there was a lot of work being done there. But um, it, this again speaks to equity issues, right? That people, that there's an assumption made by this government that everybody can afford that. And the truth is, and you see this right now with, with you know, the dollar stores not offering school supplies, uh, people can't afford to go and not everybody can afford to go to Shoppers Drug Mart and buy their school supplies there. Um, they're inflated in their prices. They can't afford to go to, the, to get those things and that the government hasn't really considered that. And, you know, they're trying to send checks to some parents to, to help cover some of those things. But at this moment in the situation we're in, um, it's really not taking into consideration the needs that people have. And, uh, and I want to add as well, you know, a lot of the other things that schools offer, like food, food programs, um, socialization, clubs, sports, all of those things, art, music, that not every family can afford to provide to their child um, if through extracurriculars. So, you know, all of those other things too, that, that mean that, that we will lose with a permanent online uh, learning model. Joy? Thank you. So just to, to Marit's point about uh, the, the issue of technology and, and what is needed for remote teaching and learning. Um, in, in my role as um, an, an ETFO liaison, I, I've traveled to different locals throughout the province, to Moose Factory, um, over to, to Kuwait and Patricia. Um, and in my, my own new home in Peterborough, Kawartha, um, if you drive just you know 20 miles north, you hit a patch of absolutely no internet. And, and this is a very, in, in, in our rural and, and uh, rural communities and in our northern areas, there are huge swaths of, of regions where there is no access to adequate broadband. So this is just another thing that this government hasn't even thought about, hasn't even considered who he's leaving behind. Um, and I'm talking about Ford and Lying Leche, they have not given any consideration to these things. And how on earth is that an equitable education? If, if you know, in uh, off the 507, there's absolutely no single signal and it's a dead zone, how can those kids in that community be able to engage in, in a fair and equitable public education? We can't and they can't. And this government is completely off the mark and, and needs to consider the needs of all, uh, of all students and all families in, in this province. Okay, thanks very much. Claire, did you wanna weigh in here? I mean, I think it's all being said. I think that it's such a good point about how hard it is to get internet and school supplies. And, you know, I think we can look for other models of delivering sort of a basic standard to every child, like if you look to uh, the Scandinavian countries that provide those baby boxes when every, every single baby is born in that country and every new parent gets a box full of the stuff you need for a newborn. Can we replicate a model like that? But the stuff you need for a school year. And it's a simple thing that comes from the government and you know there are models around the world that could be twisted and changed for this, but it shouldn't be very hard. Okay. Thank you, folks. I'm going to do one last question and then we'll have wrap up remarks because I, I have a sense we could go to midnight and I don't think most people have committed to go to midnight. So this last one, a question from Jana. I'm troubled by us even talking about return in the fall. We need children to be back now. We need the schools back now. feels like everyone is resigned to the fact that they aren't going back right now when I feel every option should have 
have to be considered. Are discussions happening at all about returning earlier in some form? Uh, Marit, I'll start with you because you're at Queen's Park right now and then we'll just go through. Right, so um, yeah, it does feel to me as well like that the government is not focused at all on returning our children to school before the summer break. And I think that's uh, that became very clear last week when the government came out with their latest funding announcement and there was nothing there for now. And there was no real commitment to working. They, in fact, the minister was, in fact, the media actually said to the minister, you sound like you're throwing your hands up in the air. And it was like, you know, yeah, that's what's happening. They, they have no plan. And I think that's really um, unfortunate because it shows me that the government has not prioritized um, our children, their learning and education. And as we all know, as parents, and education workers out there, um, this has a huge impact on our economy, on our families, on our health and well being. And so it's really, um, I could not agree more. I mean, I do believe that we have to listen to the, we need the guidance of public health experts. But my concern is that the government is not using this time to actually um, invest in the measures that would be necessary to be able to reopen the schools safely. You know, and I think that that is what is concerning me the most right now is I feel like they've given up on us and that uh, they shouldn't be giving up on us. We've all, as parents, as workers in our communities, our kids have given up so much already. Uh, they deserve uh, to, be, to be prioritized. And I think we need to, and I, I've seen a lot of amazing comments and questions in, in here, by the way, Peter, I mean, amazing questions and yeah. comments. Um, and I, I just want to say to people, a lot of people wondering, what can we do? What can we do? Yeah. Please, uh, you know, you've got an MPP here, Peter Tavins. He hears you. He's working really hard. We're working really hard in the official opposition to push back. Call the conservative MPPs. Email them. Keep it going. Uh, sign our petitions. Um, this is working. We have gotten them to move, you know, to back off on certain things and move forward in other areas. We just got to keep the pressure up. Thank you. Joy, I'll go to you. Thanks. Um, just just thinking this through and so appreciating the question. Um, the, the government has not worked on systems. Um, there hasn't been coordination. There's been a needed template uh, to lay over this emergency. Uh, and, and the government hasn't seen fit to make that a priority. So we can't do anything except conclude that, that there's a real neglect here of, of the people of this province and the families and communities. And, and that's what's needed and that's what we need to demand and that's what we need to fight for. Um, you know, we saw vaccines turn around in, in the United States when, when we had new governance. And, and uh, we, we've been, we've been we're shouting it out, we've been raising our voices, we've been coming together, yet this government doesn't listen. So we need to keep fighting together and we need to just really draw from one another and, uh, and, and try to move this mountain because it, they're not finished yet. And um, we need to fight for our children and for their futures. And uh, there's no time like this. We need to continue to do that work. Okay, thank you very much. Claire. Yeah, I, I mean, I hear you. It's so disheartening to think that school's over for the year and that that you know our kids might not see their friends for months and months or take up a pick up a musical instrument or play a game of sports for all this time and you know just to echo what what's already been said it's really about parents have, parents have got to stay together they've got you've got to keep attending sessions like this and so, working with your PTAs and calling and writing letters and and you know try to get an op-ed in write a blog post and tweet about it. Just keep talking about, keep the narrative going about who's in your kid's corner, who's in your corner, who's in your teacher's corner and who's not. And make sure that's clear and folks don't forget because there will be an election one day and there will be a chance to bring all this back up again. And when we set the bar to September, we're just deferring the problems. The investments that need to be made into the schools, you can put them in now or you put them in September, put them in now. What, what, what are we waiting for? Why do we need to wait four months for the exact same things? We know what we need. Listen to public health and, and just do it. And 
I just feel like the day that I see that you can drink on a patio before I can send my kid to outdoor learning in June, it, I don't even know what I'll say that day. That'll just break my heart. And I feel like it's coming. Okay, thank you very much. Folks, if we could wrap up, if we could just have brief remarks, I, I'll be honest, your answer to that, that question was pretty good, the three of you, but you may have things you want to say before we go. One thing that has been coming up in the commentary is the question of mental health and our children. Uh, you've talked about how we can put pressure on government. If you could, in your wrap up remarks, also just touch on this whole question of how we deal with the mental health challenges that our children, our teenagers are dealing with. Um, Claire, I'm gonna to go to you um, and we'll wind up with Mara. Sure. I mean, youth, child and youth mental health was not well managed before the pandemic and it has been poorly managed throughout the entire stretch. I have uh, colleagues who are at Sick Kids and they are talking about the just tragedies that they are seeing there of kids who are coming in. Um, it's just the uptick in supports that kids need, the feeling of isolation, the feelings, uh, uh, just all of the problems with online learning and you know, bullying and the fact that kids in unsafe situations are not being able to get out and into, um, into their schools with caring adults. It's just heartbreaking. And I know that the, are my nursing and physician colleagues there are just saying they've never seen anything like it. And it's, it is completely tragic. So um, there's so much more to speak about. I feel like you could do have a whole session on mental health yes. um, in the pandemic all on its own, because I think everyone's mental health is pretty poor at the moment. Um, but I will just wrap up. I'll just, again, say what I sort of, I said a few minutes ago, which I think that parents just can't stop. And, you know, parents are their kids' greatest allies and their greatest cheerleaders and their greatest protectors. And so parents, I, I know I'm super tired, you're super tired, but just have to keep writing those letters and keep being engaged and not letting anyone forget who, who was and who wasn't there for your kids when they needed you most. Okay, thank you very much. Joy. So as I, as I think about my own child and, and this year, um, sometimes we can get caught up in the worry, but I think when I've, I've tried to train myself to think about the good things that they have learned and the things they've learned in a different way because they haven't been in a regular school year, that they've learned some resilience, some emotional intelligence, they've, they've learned to be with us. And, and that's a meaningful thing. And when we can em embrace, and, and this, this points to some of the, the mental health and wellness pieces, you know, when we've got our teenagers or our youngsters just with us all the time and they're not with their friends, to just to continue to take advantage of those moments to be together, to be outside, to walk and talk, to listen and not push and not be so consequential maybe, uh, to just have that a little bit wider bandwidth and uh, to just try and rest together in one another and know that we're almost there. And, you know, it's just so encouraging. Uh, we know that a lot is missing, but it's so encouraging to be with 200 people um, here who care. And we are determined that uh, we're not gonna let these things continue and that there is hope for a better return and we will be in a better place soon. Picking up the phone, uh, that colleague that we haven't seen for a long time and just having a conversation, uh, that's always so helpful um, when, when people are, are alone, just those one-on-one -on -one chats. Thank you. Mark. Well, those were such lovely comments. And I tell you, as a parent, as, a, as I mentioned earlier with a teenager myself right now in school, um, it's, uh, it's been a tough year. I don't think I know any parents, uh, any families out there who don't have um, a child or youth who isn't struggling and who aren't looking for some kind of support for them right now. I, I really believe that I don't think I know anyone who isn't. So it's been very, very frustrating. And I think it's really made it very clear to all of us, uh, maybe who didn't connect this, the dots before, um, how, little, how little resources we have actually out there um, for children and youth in terms of, and young adults in terms of um, mental health supports. And the government has cut those resources actually, unfortunately, over the last few years. So um, 
I, I think kind of echoing what uh, Joy and Claire have said here a little bit, I, I my advice to, to parents is, you know, well, none of us are perfect. <laughs> none of us have all the answers. Listening to our children is like the most important thing we can do. Listening to them, taking the time to, to listen to them and to hear them. And I think also it really matters to our young people right now to know that we are, that we hear this, that we know what they're going through, and that we're going to fight like hell to make sure that the government and all levels of government uh, center their needs, center them in, in our COVID plans for recovery. It has to be front and center. I have a bill <laughs> on this <laughs> before the house, and I think it's really critical and crucial. And so let's let's not um, let's let's make sure our kids also know that we're what we're doing to try to look out for them. It's important they see their parents fighting for them. Okay, thank you. Well, there are a few things I have to say. Um, first, uh, you panelists, you're fabulous. I, I just I, I really love listening to you tonight. You had a lot of wise things to say, and I think a lot of things that all of us wanted to hear. So my, my thanks to you. Uh, I wanna thank all of you participants who joined us this evening. Uh, an awful lot of you, I'm sorry we couldn't get to all your questions and comments, um, but it makes a huge difference. I think when people get together, they share ideas and concerns. It, it builds strength and solidarity in a group and an ability to mobilize things politically. So thank you all. And for the teachers and parents who've been working so hard, trying so hard, uh, to get through and for the kids you've been supporting thank you it's been wonderful impressive what you've been able to do i want to just say a bit about political pressure i was the city councillor in the toronto danforth area in the 1990s and we had issues that we called phone melters uh, and that's when people were so upset that the phones melted on our desks we couldn't make outgoing calls because they were simply clogged uh, my advice to people to follow on what my colleagues have said is that um, there are some phones that need to melt at Queen's Park uh, and that you should talk to your fellow parents in parent councils, school councils, uh, and do that and send in emails. Some days when issues are really hot, we see it in our constituency office that the emails just keep coming in one after another continuously. Uh, Doug Ford had to back off on closing down playgrounds. He had to back off on giving the police power to stop and question everyone on the streets. Uh, he eventually had to put in even partially paid sick leave. It is possible to pressure this government. When you phone them, when you email them, you will not get back a message saying, oh, I was wrong. I'm sorry. I'll correct it right away. They'll never say that. Uh, but if you put enough pressure on them, uh, they can bend and they can turn around. And that's something that we all need to keep in mind. Uh, to my staff, Rob, Louise, Elaine, who pulled all of this together, thanks so much, folks. You worked very hard. And thank you all for joining tonight. Have a great evening. And again, we'll be posting this so you can relive it. Take care. Good night, all. Good night, everyone.